So before we get started, I want to thank um, Tara for inviting me. When I got her email, of course, I noticed her surname is Donahue, spelled the way I spell it. So I thought, of course, she was a distant cousin, but, you know, from Ireland. But no, she's here at the Cemetery Free Library and invited me to come. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, as it was said, I'm the assistant publisher of Connecticut Sports Magazine, and pick one up right, uh, when you're on your way out and take it home. And if you fill out a yellow coupon and either mail it in or give it to me tonight, I'll also mail you the fall issue because I'm convinced, or actually the summer issue, convinced that once you see the magazine and you have a chance to look at it, you'll love it the way we do. Connecticut has more interesting places to go, things to see, history to know. It'll it'll improve your social life. So, well, uh, this exhibit or this uh, lecture came about because I was asked to be the cure. Uh, curator, guest curator, uh, for a big exhibit at the at the New Haven Museum that was called Road Trip, and the what the director of the museum wanted to do was to have a big exhibit about where peace, people in New Haven went on vacation and what they did for recreation and uh, all the way up till yesterday. So we interviewed people, we did videotapes, we have them on YouTube. We, uh, people brought in their tchotchkes, their souvenirs, their cherished possessions from their trips when they were a child. And we gathered all these stories and put them together in this exhibit. And when I first started the project, the staff at the New Haven Museum, who, I, who are very professional, were a little flummoxed because they're normally used to doing exhibits about things that happened in New Haven. <laughs> And this was about things that happened outside of New Haven, places people went to. But it was all part of uh, the larger Connecticut story. So if when, once we get our, our lecture rolling, uh, I'm gonna, I've got some prepared notes, and I'll be able to show you some of the artifacts we used in the exhibit and some of the uh, things around the state. A lot of, I've got a lot of postcards, menus, matchbooks, swizzle, swizzle sticks, all kinds of things. Uh, we'll have some time afterward to talk about what your, where your favorite diner is and, and why. I actually asked the millennials that are the staff of the New Haven Museum <laughs> that question when I first started this project, and they kind of looked at me kind of dumbfounded like, well, I don't know. Whereas everybody that was a little bit older had a cherished memory of being in the car and going somewhere. So where have you gone? Do you, do you, what, Favorite vacation did you have that you went to with your parents in the car? Anybody want to start? We would always go to my grandparents, and we had it plotted out. This is in the, we didn't take interstates. We had it plotted out as to where the hamburger places were and the ice cream places were, and when to start whining at our parents. So, uh, okay, so good. Let's get let's get rolling then. Why don't you put it on the, the go ahead and put it on the next slide? These were all things from the uh, exhibit. So. Let's jump in. So Americans' love of the open road blossomed in the 1920s as more families could purchase automobiles. Whether it's a ride in the country or a cross-country trip, the freedom to choose a route, stop where you please, and bring home a cherished memento brings a sense of excitement. This adventurous spirit and enterprising entrepreneurs created the modern tourism industry, making the journey just as important and, and memorable as the destination. Now this is the ice cream box on the Berlin Turnpike. I don't remember this, but this is an image from the Library of Congress. Wow. So go ahead. Go ahead and change it. I'm trying. OK. There we go. Here we go. So today we're going to look at roadside architecture. For fans of streamlined diners, vintage gas stations, and mid-century modern motels, roadside architecture has emerged as a study of the development of buildings designed specifically, specifically to accommodate the automobile traveler beginning in the 1910s. So this is the Wilbur Cross Highway before the New Haven Tunnel. You can see the tunnel, which is an uh, engineering landmark in Connecticut. So uh, don't worry, I've taken all the work out of this tonight's traveling for you. I've gone down all the back roads and two-lane highways for 30 years. 
we're almost in May, which is National Historic Preservation Month, so this is perfect. And I think this wonderful weather really makes me also want to go out and travel. So we're going to look at the development of diners, motels, and gas stations. And at the end, I'm going to share a few of my you know, favorite seasonal food shacks that will be opening soon. Next. Now these travelers, this is Mr. and Mrs. Horton and Marion Bronson on a picnic at Lake Quantapog in Guilford in 1919. They're obviously in their own car. They can stop where they like. They're freed from the constraints of rail travel. Um, if you take a train, you're on that track. You go where that train goes. If you have your own car, you can decide where you're going. Americans took to the road in their cars even before a network of hard-surfaced roads really existed. Popular two-lane highways include the Lincoln Highway, built in 1913, which is the first transcontinental road for cars from New York City to San Francisco, and Route 66, which was built in 1926, the mother road from Chicago to Los Angeles. Next. Now this one, this might look familiar. Uh, in Connecticut, we've got Route 1, which was marked with road signs in 1926, which runs along the coastline as part of the road from Maine to Florida. We have the Merritt Parkway, which was completed in 1940 from the New York border to Milford, Connecticut, where it links up with the Wilbur Cross Parkway, 1949. The Berlin Turnpike, the Hartford Bypass, then the Charter Oak Bridge, and then the Wilbur Cross Highway, so you could go from New York City to Boston seamlessly. Now this one, this slide depicts the, what, the, what's called the College Highway, which I'm not from Connecticut originally, and I didn't know about this. And this goes r right through just about where we are. So it goes from New Haven up to Northampton, sort of following the canal that we were just talking about, you know, through Cheshire, up through Avon, this was called, uh, this postcard is the Coffee Cottage in Cheshire from about 1940. And it was called the College Highway because it connected all the various same-sex colleges so that Yale men could go to um, Northampton Women's College Mixers and vice versa. So you took Route 10. This is before you would just take 91 straight up. Next, and it even gives you, the, that one gives you all the, the uh, mileage. This one is, the, is a clam box. They had several of these, and they're showing you exactly how to get off the Merritt Parkway or um, 91, or uh, 95, to, to stop and get your clams. So they had three locations, the clam box, on major east-west roads, including one on Route 1 and one on Route 15. Next. This is, one, this is one of the original uh, signs that marked roads in Connecticut. Uh, until, we, until after the Second War and the Federal Highway Administration, you really didn't have uniform signage, and a lot of it was locally produced. Now, this is a piece from the Connecticut Historical Society, and the, this highway sign may have been used along, it was called Route Northeast 3, which was a precursor to Route 6 in New England. So this route started in New York City and continued into Connecticut. Now, automobile companies did everything they could do to promote car travel for enjoyment. Next. So we're going to look at some ads. At the beginning of the 20th century, the car was a toy for the very rich. But with manufacturers like Henry Ford, who, who made both an affordable car, as well as paid his employees enough to purchase a car, Automobiles became more accessible to the middle class. The number of registered cars more than tripled in the 1920s to an astonishing 23 million by 1930. Although car sales dropped during the Great Depression of the 1930s, Americans had registered 27.5 million cars by 1940. Car production ceased during the Second War in the 1940s, but in the 1950s, automobile production had reached unbelievable volume. In 1955 alone, 7.9 million new automobiles were shipped from the nation's factories. So let's look at some of the ads. This one, of course, is promoting going to, taking a Nash car to your favorite fishing hole. Next. 
This is a Studebaker champion made in my hometown, taking you to a quaint place that actually, that with these uh, windmills, and you can see the, the kids and dapper looking people. Next. This is a uh, Willie station wagon that could be used for work during the week and fun on the weekend. Next. This one I love. This is a 1959 Ford station wagon. This may be the model that had that third seat in the back that faced the car that, oh, right here, that faced the uh, car behind exactly. you, which was always awkward when you were the kid in that seat. Next. This is a 1970s Pontiac Grand Prix that's out on some charming road. And this is a Volkswagen, station wagon. A yeah, completely different design than the American models. Volkswagen was known for their witty ads. This one says, if you're going into the restaurant business, better not buy one new. It'll take too long to get a new one into bad enough shape. So I kind of see this, I, I, I watch all those food shows where they have uh, the, the food trucks and food truck contests. And I always look at this one and think, aha, it's somewhere between a diner and a food truck. Next. So as Americans began to use the car for entertainment and amusement, Connecticut manufacturers produced a wide array of products that could be taken for a ride in the country. This is an advertisement from 1957 for a thermos brand picnic and lunch kit. So um, I had this one. I remember the tin, those tin ones. This was a little more modern, a little different color scheme instead of the traditional plaid but you've got everybody's thrilled to have these for Christmas. These, this, uh, Naga, this was made out of that Naga hide material, uh, another Connecticut product, and it would fit your, your thermoses in there and these little lunch boxes for your sandwiches. Next. And here we go, there's a closer look at those. And there's the thermos. Now, lunch sets were also made by Landers Frary and Clark in New Britain. This is called the Universal Outing Set, 1955. Now, this was an interesting product. The, um, one of the things we do at Connecticut Explored is we look for those stories that are obviously have Connecticut history and are Connecticut based. So I had become aware of this product because of the magazine. But this was um, something that showed you that the comforts of home could also be found in your car. This is the Casco cigarette lighter. Until the 1990s, dashboard cigarette lighters were standard equipment in almost all American-made cars. The major producer of these lighters was the Connecticut automotive specialty company known as Casco Products Corp, founded by Joseph H. Cohn in Bridgeport, 1921. This is a 1958 uh, display panel where you could buy an a automatic lighter replacement because the little filaments would kind of burn out after a while. And I was thinking about this little um, example when I interviewed people for the exhibit and I asked so many different people whether they had ever stuck their finger in those, in those lighters and you would not believe the number of college-educated people who did that as a kid, <laughs> you know. And I still remember everyone's mother saying, don't stick your finger in there, don't stick your finger on it, it's hot. Next. Now, one of, the, one of our audience members was talking about the Richard Longstress book because she had him for a professor. This is a Richard Longstress photograph. This is not in Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut, because we're a, we're, we're a state that has been remade and remade and suburbanized and rebuilt and rebuilt. We don't have uh, very many vintage gas stations left at all. So in the exhibit, we did use some of Richard Longstreth's great photographs from other places, but these are all from New England. Um, so the increasing popularity of automobiles in the 19-teens led to, to the development of services and products for motorists first served by gas pumps at the side of the curb, fed by above-ground barrels. They were soon pulling into stations with pumps constructed to pull fuel from underground storage tanks. Oil companies sought hundreds of locations to sell their product. By 1920, there were approximately 15,000 gas stations in the United States. 
Shell Oil Company was one of the first to brand itself. It used the same graphics, color schemes, pump equipment, and uniforms for all its stations. Fuel companies, driven in part by roadside architecture critics who thought gas stations were tacky, and by the, design, the desire to stand out to the motorists, made their gas station designs more and more ornate, resembling such structures as an English cottage or a Spanish tile villa. This would be in sort of a very elaborate neoclassical design. Next. This one is sort of a Mexican Mayan t Art Deco tile. Next. And then this kind, which you still, still see a few of, this one is made out of, um, made to have a more modern look after World War II. It's sleek enameled metal panels and smooth surfaces to give it a modern look. Gas stations before the 1970s provided full service, which my kids don't understand, in which the attendant would not only pump gas, but also clean windshields and check the oil. Next. Here's a gas, a gas station ad for mobile, where they, you, you see they've started to use their color scheme and branding. Um, Gulf Oil was one of the last ones to get in on this idea of having a brand color scheme. So they ended up what were considered the worst colors, which were blue and orange. And those are still the colors they use today. Next. Now this little fascinating thing, you might wonder, what the heck is that? It kind of looks like a bomb. But let me tell you, this is also made in Connecticut. This is a um, made by the Veter Root Company, which if you've ever gone to the Connecticut Historical Society, that's the Veter Mansion. Well, the Veter Root Company, their specific uh, point of business and the thing that they're still, they still create are gauges and very clever interlocking mechanisms. Um, now they're, they're computerized and digitized. But this little item revolutionized gasoline sales. The Vita Roop gasoline pump ca uh, computer, which this is not digital or anything, it's all the little gauges move, um, made it so that the gasoline pump sales were regularized. So instead of a gas station attendant looking at a price chart, they look at, they look at the pump and they say, okay, the station uh, attendant could instantly read the final total of the gas sale, and the customer could see how much each gallon of gas had cost and how many gallons had been pumped. So this mechanism would calculate up to 10 gallons. Now before that, the customer always thought they were being cheated, and the gas station attendant always thought they were being cheated because uh, the customer never thought they got the amount of gas that they were told they got, and vice versa for the attendant. Next. So this is, this is an ad for that. So that mechanism that we just saw fits into the gas pump. Next. And I, that's a real Yankee Connecticut ing, ingenuity right there. Now this is in Connecticut. This is Higgies. Um, stopping for a bite to eat was a big deal. Automobile travelers may have packed picnic lunches for short trips, but also dependent on roadside restaurants or diners. Convenience and American enthusiasm for eating out contributed to the growth of the restaurant industry. My grandmother never ate out. Her thing was, you packed it, you brought it, you brought food with you to other people's houses, casseroles and cakes. She just, that, her, her age group really did not sit, feel like they, should sit down at a restaurant. They, she made stuff. My mother, on the other hand, was a big fan of stopping, she had, with us five kids, stopping somewhere and getting those hamburgers or hot dogs along the road. So from 1920 to 1927, the number of restaurants of all kinds grew a whopping 40%. Food stands began popping up at convenient stopping points along busy roads. These road-sized businesses were perfect for the independent businessman. New England is the home to seasonal food stops, clam shacks, lobster pounds, hot dog stands, and ice cream stands. This is Higgy's, which is on um, Route 154, the alternative route, to, or the original route to the shore through Middletown. So you'd, the cars would actually be so clogged, going trying to go to Old Lyme and Old Saybrook from Hartford, that they would 
actually literally almost be stopped in front of these food stands that go all the way down that, that particular road. Now, not all Americans were as charmed by I, as I am by the cobbled together look of uh, roadside food stops. Historian Chester Leibs notes that in 1928, Mrs. John D. Rockefeller and the American Civic Association even sponsored a competition to clean up the hodgepodge of unsightly hot dog stands and the accompanying riffraff of roadside markets. So, um, next. This is Higgy's Now. Uh, one of the earliest seasonal food shacks in Connecticut is uh, in Haddam. Next, please. There we go. Spencer's Haddam Shad Shack on Route 154 was founded in 1930 by Benjamin Franklin Spencer. Now abandoned, the Spencer Shad Shack operated from April to June when the shad travel up the Connecticut River to spawn. So during this short season, Spencer served breakfast, lunch, and dinner to take in as much money as possible. They offered scrambled eggs with shad roe, traditional shad bake, and broiled shad. Next. And that's, this is, this, Chad has a ton of little bones, so these are the ladies actually boning this thing, and here's the proprietors. And that little building is still there. Next. Now we're going to talk about the Streamline Diner, though. This is on the Berlin Turnpike. This is the Olympia, Di Olympia Diner. The Streamline Diner is a pop culture icon. From its origins in the lunch wagon to diners that look like train cars to sleek models with rounded stainless steel shells, diners became family-friendly stops along the road. Here's two streamlined diners that you can visit today on the Berlin Turnpike. This one is the Olympia, and that's, that's the inside. And this is the Macris. So they're, a little, they're, they're, by, two different, they're by two different companies but they're both really terrific inside and they're just really intact. Can you go back just a quick second so I can see the inside? Really? Sure. Really? Oh no, never mind. <laughs> okay, so, so they're, they're, you see like the, the diner booths go back to the 20s. That, that same idea of the two booths with the little table in between, then the idea of the low stools and the counter and it was supposed to be a, a um, benefit that you could see the cook at work because you knew what you were getting. He's cooking it on a flat top right in front of you. And then you've got uh, usually the pie, the pie stands. Uh, later on, you get the jukeboxes. Now, rest, let's see. Keep, oh, oh, and that's the macros. So that's got the stainless steel panels in the back with this wonderful Art Deco design. And you can really see the streamlined effect even in the ceiling panels. Where's the Macris? Macris is at the beginning of the Berlin Turnpike near Hartford. Oh. That's where countless generations of Trinity College men have spent late nights. <laughs> so now this is an example of restaurant dishes that were designed to be sturdier than those that were produced for home use. They had to withstand constant use, careless handling, and commercial washing. Now this was some, uh, a little piece I borrowed from the, uh, for the exhibit. I actually borrowed it right out of the diner in New Haven where it normally is, Clark's Ice Cream Diner, which is near Yale on Whitney. So this is a jukebox, and it's circa the 1970s. Clark's is an iconic New Haven diner, an ice cream shop, and it's been owned by the same Greek family since 1962. So they, they serve uh, both hamburgers and hot dogs and ice cream, as well as more, like, more Greek specialties, too, which is a, a common mixture. Next. Now, these are blueprints that I borrowed. This is a shop drawing for Harry and Jack Berkowitz for a diner that is still there at 1226 Chapel Street in New Haven. Now it's the Tandor restaurant. It's a wonderful Indian restaurant. And it's a streamlined diner on the corner of Chapel and Howe Street that was produced by the Mountain View Diner Company in 1955. And I was thrilled to see like the, uh, I know you can't see these from where you are, but they unfolded this. I borrowed this from the Diner Museum and um, all the, you can see where all the booths were. This is a double wide diner, so it has booths that wrap all the way around. And the Indian restaurant that's there now has kept everything. 
and just added kind of a layer of decoration. And so they actually have like their bar is the low stools and they use, uh, they use all the diner booths. It, it's, it's a really fun one. If you go to the, any of the museums or you go to Ikea in New Haven, I recommend stopping at that restaurant. So the um, diner is still in its original location. That company produced for over 400 diners from 1938 to 1957. And this has um, the upholstered booths, the stamped stainless steel panels inside and out. And it has, if you're standing in front of it to go in, it has its diner tag. Diners were numbered. So they, each company would put a number on it, kind of like the VIN number in your car. So you could track down what year and where things were originally shipped to in a lot of cases because of those numbers. And diner enthusiasts and buffs have, there's just, there's a book on every one of these companies. A lot of them were in New Jersey. So that tag is actually still there. And it was funny because I pointed it out to the current owner and he, he didn't realize, I had a hard time explaining to him that it correlated to the manufacturing um, number. But he knew that other people have had, had asked about it. They said, you know, where is it? So he knew right where it was. He just didn't know what it was exactly. Next. And you can just see this is a shop, the shop drawing, okayed. This is, a, this is a matchbook. Now the um, restaurants first gave away matchbooks as free advertising in the 1890s. This is the Tasty Toasty Luncheonette, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, on Temple Street, but opposite Malley's. And so it has this crazy tiled pattern. I, I don't know if this was the, truly the color scheme, but it's great. And here's, here's the, low, the low stools. And that's a matchbook, oh, you know, opened up flat. So matchbooks were um, useful for hotels, motels, restaurants, and tourist attractions as a cheap promotional item. Collectors of matchbooks are known as voluminists, which means lovers of light. Matchbooks of often portray logos, slogans, and drawings of the establishments that they're advertising. Next. Now this is in actually a little further south. This is in Maryland. This is a long stretch photo, and the, we're just going to talk about um, the green book for a minute. This actually says cabins, and then it says <laughs> colored here. So most motorists could expect to find a comfortable bed and a hot meal almost anywhere along the road, but throughout the era of Jim Crow and racial segregation until the 19, late 1960s, African American travelers were never assured that they would be served at restaurants, allowed to rent rooms at motels, or able to purchase gasoline. So this is a Longstress, Longstress, Richard Longstress photo that shows the colored sign at a motel in Maryland. So this encouraged me to look further into travel by African Americans in Connecticut. Next. This is a, a cover of a green book from 1947. And all of these are online at the Schomburg Center of the New York Public Library. And you might think that they only have sites in the south. But no, it's throughout the entire country. So Connecticut has a large section. So beginning in 1936, Victor Green, hence the Green Book, uh, who is an African-American mailman in New York City, published the Negro, ne the Negro Motorist Green Book, a travel guide to businesses in New York City that would serve black customers. A year later, he expanded his book to include businesses across the nation. On the motto, it said, Care, on the cover it said, carry your green book with you, you may need it. Green counted on word of mouth to compile listings and asked his readers to send him information about businesses that welcome black customers. He listed a wide array of business types including hotels, tourist homes, which were private homes willing to rent rooms to travelers, nightclubs, restaurants, service stations, and beauty parlors. Not restricted to places in the South, the guide covered most states and larger cities. By 1940, the Green Book included seven cities in Connecticut. New Haven's listings included hotels, tourist homes, restaurants, beauty parlors, and a beauty school. Next. So here's, here's, New, here's, New, ha here's New Haven. So Hartford, New Haven, New London, Stanford, Waterbury, West Haven are all in 1947. 
So um, most of these were located in New Haven in the Dixwell neighborhood, including the Monterey Club at 265 Dixwell Avenue. The building still stands. Uh, jazz, there were jazz clubs in New Haven. There were two different jazz musician unions in New Haven, a white jazz musician union and an African-American one. There were hotels uh, like the ones uh, near the green that were the white music musicians played at. There were clubs owned by black star, black entertainers. And uh, this one, the Monterey Club was owned by uh, a former vaudeville star. And so people uh, like Billy, um, Billy Holiday, Duke Ellington, and John Coltrane went to the Monterey Club in this uh, in the Dixwell neighborhood. Let's see. Uh, I don't see it. The second, uh, because they because they oh here it is the Monterey Club right here, um, because they knew that at, even though they were performing sometimes in white hotels and in white establishments, they still needed a place where they could go, be served, have entertainment themselves, and be able to locate somewhere to stay overnight. There's a new project, a national project called Mapping the Green Book, which is intended to document all the remaining sites that were once included in the Green Book, which was published from 1936 to 1966. Next. This is the Monterey Club with the uh, founder's son at the, right there at the bar. Next. Let's look at hotels for a second. Now, this is the Red Cedars Hotel Court in, uh, on the Berlin Turnpike. It's now been replaced by a more modern motel. But uh, the Berlin Turnpike is really a um, museum of motel types. And now uh, some of those are quite seedy. But in, in their day, they really represented a, a big change in how Americans traveled. So after World War I, car travelers often packed their own camping gear. Auto camping became the rage. Municipally owned camps gave way to privately owned camps and ultimately to facilities offering small cabins. So you can see here's the, the owner's home, the office, and these are the small cabins. There's still a place up, I think the cabins are still there by the, where the Y is between Simsbury and Grand and it has a bunch of them. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, the motor hotel or motor, motor court was born simultaneously with the auto camps of the 1920s. The term motel can be traced to 1925, but the development of an adjoining series of rooms rented out as individual units blossomed after World War II. Clean, respectable, and brimming with amenities, motels were often mom and pop family businesses. Next. This is, a red, this is another view of that same Red Cedars court on uh, the Berlin Turnpike. And see, now they've gotten their, they started to get their signature sign. So it says Red Cedars Tourist Court. Next. This is Lakeview Cabins on uh, it's Route 6 in Terryville and Route 22. Same idea with the homeowner, the hotel owners live right there and then they rent out the cabins. Next. This, this is the back of that card. And it, it says, you know, um, showers, toilets, hot and cold running water in each cabin, not you didn't have to go down to take a shower somewhere else, cooking facilities, bathing, boating, rent day, week, or month, or season, reasonable rates. Next. Now this is the Avon Diner. Um, this is one where you can see the little cabins in the back. And it became common to try to have your cabins, a restaurant, and a gas station. Next. This is Blue Hills Cabins in New London. So um, Connecticut's own uh, Berlin Turnpike was nicknamed the Gasoline Alley in the post-war period. The 11-mile strip had at least 20 traffic lights and was lined with over 200 businesses. It was considered one of the great neon capitals of the Northeast. And it's still got this encyclopedia of little buildings. Next. This one is called Smith's Motel. It's a little more, uh, little more homey. Next. 
Friendly Acres, next. This one has got the model where they've got the, they've got the restaurant right there. Now this is the change though. This is where you start, they've started to connect the cabins. Next. This one has got, um, is all, it's connected with the office in the middle and then has this really big landscaped area in the front. That's on the Berlin Turnpike. The Little Village Motel is painted white now and this diner isn't there, but this building is there and it actually looks pretty well, pretty well kept. The, it's a, uh, it was called the Little Village Motel and Gift Shop, built in 1950 in Berlin. And it, was, it, it aimed for a more picturesque domestic look. Uh, the L-shaped motel has a small Colonial Revival office, which is right here. And then it's uh, got the roofline cupola. Since the roadside frontage is relatively narrow, the motel counts uh, on a prominently placed office and a motel sign to slow the motorist down. The suggestion of a safe and comfortable stay is further emphasized by the small scale of the motel and its landscape grounds with ornamental fences, arbors, and benches. This, and this early postcard shows the diner next door. Next. Now this is a big one. This is in, is, is in Weathersfield. This is the Hartford Motel. As the hotel business became more competitive, businesses had to offer more to the tourist. Large motel signs at the side of the road began not only to tout the price of the room, but showers, tile bath rooms, color television, swimming pools and playgrounds, as well as air conditioning. The Hartford Motel, this is 1955 in Weathersfield, was laid out in a long linear strip behind a grassy lawn. Designed to incorporate a freestanding gas station as well as a restaurant, the motel offered the northbound uh, motorist his last chance to rest, eat, or get gas before taking the bridge over the Connecticut River to the uh, Wilbercross Highway east of Hartford. Now, not everybody was happy with these commercial developments. Uh, in 1950, in Weathersfield, the neighborhood's neighbors strenuously objected to a, a uh, request to change the zoning along this portion of the Berlin Turnpike from residential to business with a proposal for an $85,000 U-shaped motel in the Spanish style, which is this one. But the Weathersfield Zoning Board approved the change, arguing uh, that the fact that this was a thoroughfare handling 28,000 cars a day clearly gave it more commercial value than it would have as a single family residential zone. Next. This is also that same motel, but that shows you the inside, uh, one of the rooms. This trendy plaid wallpaper. Next. Now this is the queen of the Berlin Turnpike. This is the Grant Moore. Uh, it was built in 1959 in Newington. It's the most architecturally commanding motel in the Turnpike, and it offered, also offered the most complete package for the tourist. It was billed as the gracious Grant Moore when it first opened. It had a large restaurant and a banquet hall, which is now the Sphinx Lodge, an L-shaped swimming pool with a slide and a golf course. It was sleek enough for business travelers, but the Grant Moore catered also to leisure travelers with golf for dad and a pool for the kids. Next. This is it now. Um, it's executed in a truly modern architecture style. It incorporates precast concrete zigzags at the roof line and originally had a railing with solid panels in primary colors. Next. This, is the, this was the restaurant. This is the Sphinx Lodge now. The Grant Moore and the Berlin Turnpike were bypassed by traffic once Interstate 91 was built in 1965. The Grant Moores had a hard time attracting business in the 1970s and 80s, switched to an adult theme with heart-shaped hot tubs, mirrored ceilings, and round beds that are still on the current ads on the web. Next. This is the Howard Johnson's. Now, chain motels started to move into the Connecticut market. With 1,000 locations, Howard Johnson's, often called Hojo's, was one of the largest hotel motel chains in the United States in the 60s and 70s. They were also famous for their restaurants that advertised 28 flavors of ice cream and signature fried clam sandwiches. Howard Johnson restaurants had a distinctive orange roof, making them easy for the motorists to recognize. Next. There's the orange roof. Next. 
And then here's the postcards that are by now are free and they're just advertising. They're hoping that they're, you're going to send those out. This is from Milford. Next. This is a Howard Johnson's uh, Children's Bank. And then this was a game. This was a, um, a free game. It's a presidential menu type of game. And um, you slide it around and you can figure out the state and know your states and know the foods from those states. Next. Oh, here's the presidential hat one. The last one was the know your states. This is the presidential hat one. Next. And then this one is, um, we're just going to go through 10 slides of different motels that were in Connecticut. This is Manchester. This is New Haven. Uh, Berlin Turnpike. Berlin Turnpike. This is a really old-fashioned old one, and that's still there with these little buildings. Wilbur Cross Highway in Berlin. This one is in Enfield. And I'm not sure where this one is. Berlin Turnpike, I think. And Plainville. Berlin Turnpike. Milford, Motor Court. Now we, when we get to um, the Interstate Highway, which opened in 1965, uh, Interstate 91 siphoned much of the New Haven Hartford traffic away from local roads such as the Berlin Turnpike. Interstate 95 siphoned motorists away from Route 1. Tourist cabins and motels struggled to attract business. Upkeep declined, swimming pools were filled in, and seediness and prostitution were reported. Now here's a national ad from the Portland Cement Association that features Interstate 91 through Hartford. So you can see here's Travelers and Colts, so you know you're in Hartford. Um, it makes a claim that the new interstate system is already preventing 90,000 accidents a year and is three times safer than other roads. The interstate system eliminated two full days of driving coast to coast, and the ad also states that you will relax as never before as you steer a course over smooth riding stretches of modern concrete. Next. So Connecticut's roadside architecture is at risk of demolition due to an upturn in the economy again and renewed development. There are very few vintage ga gas stations in Connecticut, and few of the, the state's mid-century modern motels have been rehabilitated to serve today's travelers. Ski's Diner and Harry's are two of Hartford's roadside architectures, uh, uh, roadside restaurants that are uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places because of their architecture. More of these roadside landmarks must be documented. And maybe they'll survive long enough to be discovered by the next generation of devotees and historic preservationists. If, you've, if I've missed your favorite piece of roadside architecture or you want to see what's out there, I recommend two websites. One is Roadside America, and the second is Road Food. Road Food, that foodie blog, lists 158 local diners in Connecticut alone. So let, let's just look at three of my absolute favorite summerside stops. This is Blackie's in Cheshire, and it's a hot dog, primarily a hot dog stand. Its eye-catching vintage neon sign announces the home of Connecticut's most architecturally outstanding hot dog stand. It was started in 1928 when Art Blackman opened a gas station with his wife. The hot dog soon became more popular than the gas. The building was built, in, this building was built in 1945. As with many of these places, they have their own hot relish that they serve. Next. Where in Cheshire is it? It's on, um, they have a website if you Google it. It's not, it's, it's off of 84. When 84 blasted through, it left the little side street that has Blackie's on it, so Blackie survived. It's on exit 26. Oh, ex <laughs> that's my husband, exit 26, there we go. And here's this it's wonderful neon. On Friday, right. Even today. Even today, and they take cash. I think that's the other thing. Now here's their here's their um, their own relish. Here's their neon sign. Next. Now this is the Sea Swirl in Mystic on Route One. This is a roadside two for one. It's a popular clam shack that operates in a nearly pristine former Carvel ice cream shop. So if you look at this. 
Um, you probably remember those Carvel shops. So founded by Greek immigrant Tom Carvel in 1929, the Carvel Ice Cream Company patented this all glass front pitched roof building in 1947. An architecturally similar design was later made famous by the McDonald's hamburger chain. The Sea Swirl restaurant here in this building opened in 1985 and it's known regionally for its outstanding Hobelli clams and soft serve ice cream. One more. Delicious. There's the close up. I re seriously recommend this. Delicious. I, I backed that up. <laughs> okay, good. And then the last one I wanted to show you is the Pilot House in Haddam. In operation since 1945, the Pilot House is within view of the Connecticut River on Route 154, the main road between Hartford and the shoreline. Famous for hot dogs and burgers, it also has its own relish. Thank you. There's a vintage Carvels, it's still a Carvels in uh, Torrington, yep. isn't it? Okay. It's like state-of-the-art vintage. It's like really, <laughs> I thought that's what it was, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Great. I don't know how to call it. Blackies, these are big garage, big garage doors that open up. It's just great. So um, I know we had a chance to talk beforehand. Anybody else want to share anything or their favorite diner? In the first uh, group of cars, there was a yellow car, and the back door was opening this way. Yeah. You didn't comment on that at all. Is it the, was it the station wagon? No, it was a car. Oh, it was a regular car? It was a regular car, yeah. and the doors opened this way instead yeah. of this right. way. Yeah. It's funny you should say that, because I've been watching Amazon, for some reason, has loaded all these movies from the 1930s and 40s on the streaming service. So I've been watching them, and so many of those cars had the doors that open the opposite way that we think of now. Absolutely. More common than I thought. Well, thank you so much. Oh, question. right here. Um, not a question, just a, another comment. Um, we always traveled up to Connecticut from New Jersey when I was little, and there were all the little picnic areas on oh, the blue yeah. highways that had Connecticut maps, you know, oh. as their signs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, usually there was, you know, picnic tables, you know, an area for kids to run around. But yeah. our family frequently picnicked because we had a lot of kids and not a lot of Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming out. Um, Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.